We've come. We've come to give God the glory. To give God the glory. Oh yes, we've come. Oh, yes, we've come to give Him praise. To give Him praise. We've come. We've come to give Him the honor. To give Him the honor. Let's magnify Him. Let's magnify Him. All of our ways. In all of our ways. Who are we? We're interceding, Christian Center. We hope that you felt welcome. From the time that you entered into the house of God bless you, beloved. Once again, Apostle Dr. Schaefer, the pastor of Interceding Christian Center, is located at 414 Thompson Avenue in the beautiful city of West Memphis, Arkansas. To God Almighty be the glory, great things that He has done. Let me first encourage you. Beloved, the same God who kept you through the years, who kept you when you were sick, who kept you when down, kept you when things seemed like they would not go the way that they should go. It's the same God who's able to keep you and is keeping you now. Hallelujah. To God Almighty be the glory. Walk in faith, not in fear. Hallelujah. Recently, Lord dropped inside of my spirit a sermon that came from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, with a focal point being the 23rd verse of that scripture, set of scriptures, amen. The focal verse being, unto the Jews, Jesus became a stumbling block. But just like the Jews, we have our issues as well. There are some things that causes us to stumble. So in a sermon that's entitled, What Are You Tripping On? Let's go into the sanctuary here, thus said the Lord. Come on, let's go. Oh, God. Go me over to the book, hallelujah, of 1 Corinthians, hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse, beginning at verse 18. Go with me there if you would. The first book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says this. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The power of God, hallelujah. But it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We glorify you on this day for your mercy, which endures to all generations, O God. Oh, oh God, I pray, oh, hide me behind the cross, oh God. As John the Baptist said, Father God, let me decrease that he may increase. That he may be glorified, glorified. Let me decrease. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh God, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to try not to be before you long, but I want to talk to you for just a little while on this morning. Let's look back at verse 23. Verse 23 for a title and focus on this morning. Mm -hmm. Verse 23 says this. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. Hallelujah. Now the brother Paul, his chief complaint was how the death of Jesus on the cross for the world came as foolishness to Gentiles. Foolishness because of their vanity, they didn't allow them to see that Jesus was the one who came to save us and his grace allowed us to be reconciled unto God Almighty. It was foolish unto them, my God, my God, oh my God, foolish unto them because there's no way that they thought that any man would die for another man without a cost, my God, my God, hallelujah. It was foolish unto them, hallelujah. They didn't realize that God was using Christ Jesus to allow us to come into the presence of his grace. But instead of accepting the free gift, gift of grace offered by God, they balked at the offer that God had given them. And they joined the caravan of those who were going to a sinner's hell. See, in the eyes of the world, preaching of the cross was needed. Was needed. They thought the preaching of the cross was un indeed foolishness. Indeed foolishness. To the world, Jesus was just another Jew that had died. 
Hallelujah. But worse than the rejection of the world was the rejection of his own people. Right. Nothing hurts you worse than someone that rejects you that you thought loved you. That someone who cared about. Nothing hurts you worse than this. I'm trying to get to a title. Help me, Holy Spirit. I'm trying to get to this thing. Amen, amen, amen. Jesus, the Messiah, was rejected by the Jews, his own people. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. He was rejected by the Jews, which proved to be the reason he was rejected because he was against their envisionment of what the Messiah was. Uh -huh. Their envisionment because they thought that their freedom came could only be gained by fighting a physical war right. and destroying their physical enemies, beating their physical enemies. They thought that their freedom from the Romans could only come if Jesus the Messiah came and came as that physical warrior. Right. Hallelujah. But after they had all, after they had won those battles, listen, listen, listen. They had won battles before. We know that they had defeated much larger armies before by the grace of God. Right. But, but not being mindful that they would only win a temporary reprieve. They would only win a temporary reprieve. They would only win a temporary reprieve because before the Romans, there were the Greeks. Before the Greeks, there were the uh, Egyptians. Before the Egyptians, there were the Syrians. My God, my God. And because they did not trust that God knew how to make their victory eternal, they failed. Because they did not know that God was going to make their victory eternal. See, physical things are only temporal anyway. But the eternal victory that God was going to give them came through Christ Jesus was going to be eternal and permanent. Hallelujah. And because they did not trust God for the eternal victory, Christ proved to them to be a stumbling block. A stumbling block. Which is something that gets in your way. A stumbling block gets in your way. And if you don't see the stumbling block in your path, you can trip on that stumbling block. Hallelujah. When you don't see your path, you can fall over and onto that stumbling block. So for a title this morning, I ask you to, I ask you a question for a title this morning. What are you tripping on? Right. What are you tripping on? Hallelujah. Ask your neighbor what? No, don't do that. Hallelujah. <laughs> What are you tripping on? What are you tripping on? Back in the 60s and 70s, and I know most people are not old enough to remember that. I know I'm old enough, amen. The phrase, they tripping, came into being. Came into being. And that phrase is related to the use of drugs. It's related to the use of drugs. Hallelujah. People of all kinds were using all kinds of concoctions. Hallelujah. And those concoctions would have them hallucinating. Would have them seeing things that wasn't even there. Would allow them to see the proverbial pink elephant in the room. Hallelujah. They would hallucinate. And, in, and, and being in the current state they were in, they were no longer in the current state they were in. They were in a state of hallucination. And people said that they were not where they should have been. They were on a trip. So in other words, they were tripping. The drug became what caused them to not be in their right mind. And their right mind couldn't get it together. Because every time they tried to get it together, or every time they came down from that high, the demonic grip of the drug demon pulled them back in, or worked to draw them back in. And they, they put it back into their veins, put it back into their nose, put it back into their mouth. Hallelujah. And they continued tripping. They continue tripping. Well, now this morning I want to talk to you about how the term came into regular use and how I'm going to use this term this morning and how it applies so easily to us as children of the Most High God. Up front, when you want to do what is right, it is understood what Paul said in Romans 7 and 24 and 25. When I choose to do what's right, wrong is ever before me. It's always trying to trip me up, always trying to pull me in. Wrong is like a gorilla on your back trying to wrestle you into something that you should not be doing. When I try to do right, my God, my God, I don't know about you, but I try to do right, but sometimes it's so hard. Sometimes things come against me in order to stop me from doing what's right. Sometimes things try to press me toward the mark that's not of Christ Jesus. Oh my God. I don't know about you. I know you guys are all super saved and never went through nothing. 
nothing and not going through nothing on a daily basis, my God. I know some of y'all so super saved, you don't need but a word every now and then. But I need a word each and every day. I need the Lord to bring me out each and every day, my God, my God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. The enemy is always rushing after me to try to push me into doing things that are not right. Hallelujah. He's always trying to get me to go on a trip. To go on a trip. The Lord Jesus knew that we would have problems in this world. This is why he prayed for us. He prayed for us that we would desire righteousness. And that even when we did fall, that we would not fall so far that we could not get back up. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but he had to reach way down to pick me up. Not only did he have to reach way down to pick me up, he had to use equipment like a backhoe to pick me up. I don't know about you. I mean, I, I look, I know y'all saved and y'all ain't never been through anything, you never did nothing in your life. You've been in church your entire life. I know that, my God, my God. But he had to reach way down to pick Brian up. Hallelujah. He had to pick way down to pick me up, my God. And my feet were so stuck in the Murray clay, I feel as if he had to use a spiritual chisel to dig me out. Hallelujah. Glory unto God. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, my God. I don't know about you, but there's some things in this world that the enemy wants to throw at us right. and cause us to trip. Hallelujah. There are some things that, that pushes our buttons uh -huh. and have us call in the travel agency telling Jesus to take a very long trip. Hallelujah. And while he's on his trip, while he's on vacation, we can come up and go ham and go on our trip. Uh -huh. The truth has and the truth always will be a tripping point for people. It always will be a tripping point, especially for those who desire to live contrary to what the word of God says. Right. Contrary to what the word of God says. I remember a time where it's, uh, I was up in Washington, D.C. And what happened was there was a, a rally for, for marriage for man and woman only. And across the street, there was a smaller rally. It was a young man carrying a sign that said, homosexual Christians are accepted by Christ. Now, if you talk to a young man and you never got around to his sexuality, you would probably think that he's saved. Hallelujah. But when it came to the point of the tripping stone or the stumbling block of his sexuality, again, you saw what there really was an issue. We've got to be very careful because a lot of times we're putting people in heaven, but we don't know how they're living their life. We don't know if they're living their life the way that the word of God says. And we find out that there are stumbling blocks and tripping stones in their path. My God, my God, my God, my God. Hallelujah. The truth has and the truth always will prove to be a stumbling block or a tripping point for people who desire to live in this world. You're going along just fine. You're going along just fine until what you should step around. You try to step through and you trip on it like a new toddler. Instead of stepping around that thing that would trip him up, he's trying to step through it and he trip up. Hallelujah. There's a story told in the Bible about Jesus and and it's a story, not a parable, a story of Jesus and the rich young man. The young man was living a decent life. He came to Jesus and said, I'm living a good life. I'm doing real good. But, but man, what does it take to get in heaven? In other words, what he was really saying was, look at me, I'm about to go in. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was trying to get the attention of Jesus to say, so that Jesus would say, you on your way already, brother. You ain't got to do nothing else. You already done well enough. It wasn't even my works that got you in. It was your work, brother. You good. This is what he was seeking from the Lord. But instead, the Lord began to talk to him. And he talked to him about the Ten Commandments. He gave him six of the Ten Commandments that applies to how we treat other people. The Ten Commandments is really two parts. There are ten there, but the first four deal with our relationship with God. Have no other God before. The first four deal with how we live our relationship with God. The next six deal with how we deal with people. Right. Our relationship with other people. Oh, or how we treat other people. In other words, our earthly character which will allow us to get into the presence of God Almighty. Hallelujah. First and foremost, if you put God at the beginning of your life, hallelujah, and live your life according to what God says, have no other God before me, and the things that relate to God, oh, oh, those things right there, if you put God at the beginning of that thing, hallelujah, then you'll be able to walk into those other things and live a holy and acceptable life.
life before God. And at the end of the commandment, you'll see that God is keeping you. He's not forsaking you. He's constantly allowing you not to trip on everything. Oh, let me ask you again. What are you tripping on? What are you tripping on? My God, my God. Hallelujah. So the young man, you know, he, he was talking to Jesus. Hallelujah. And Jesus recited to him the commandments that deal with our earthly character and relationship with others. He said, thou shall not kill. Thou shall not commit adultery. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not bear false witness unto your father and your mother. Thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. Those those six things that deal with our relationship with other people. The young man quickly said, I have kept those things. I can see them right now. I've kept those things since I was a boy. Man, look at me. Hallelujah. I've kept those commandments since I was a boy onward. The Lord wasn't asking him, get this, the Lord wasn't asking him if he had kept those things as he knew the young man had kept those things. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He wasn't asking him if he had kept those things. He knew that he had kept those things. But Jesus saw beyond what the young man had kept, which was those commandments, to see what was keeping him from getting into heaven. What would keep him from getting into heaven? Jesus saw, in other words, what would trip him up. Jesus saw the tripping stone. He saw the stumbling block. He saw exactly what would cause the young man not to make it into the kingdom. And he asked for that thing that would make the young man not make it into the kingdom. He asked for the wealth of the young man. But the wealth of the young man was something he loved. He depended on something he counted on because he counted on that wealth. His wealth became his tripping stone. I asked the question, what are you tripping on? What are you tripping on? Hallelujah. Jesus saw the solution and he was trying to get the young man to the solution. The solution was to give up that desire of the earthly wealth. It wasn't because he was wealthy he wouldn't make it into the kingdom. It wasn't because that. Because it's not money that makes you not make it to the kingdom. It's the love thereof and how you act toward money which allows you not to make it into the kingdom or keeps you from the kingdom. My God, my God. My question for you is oh, what are you tripping on? Are you tripping on your job, your position? Are you tripping on your salary? Are you tripping on your car? Are you tripping on your house? How are you tripping on your relationship with them? What are you tripping on? Oh, let me move on. Hallelujah. Six things. Now, six things, six points, and I'm going to wrap it up. Six reasons that we be tripping with the Lord. Six reasons that we be tripping with the Lord. Those six things are often like a combo because combined with those six things is a large order of unbelief, like a large order of French fries. You said supersized mind, biggie sized mind, right? Yeah. A large order of French fries. Uh -huh. And almost evident in all those six things you'll find in this story I just told you about the young man, the young rich noble man. Uh -huh. He had those things that were working against him to keep him out of the kingdom. Yeah. Oh, can I give you number one? Yeah. Number one is self sufficiency. Oh, yeah. uh, believing in self or the confidence in self is not the problem. That's not the problem. Let's get it straight. No man is or woman is self-sufficient. No matter how much they say that they're self-sufficient, nobody is self-sufficient. And I'm assuming everyone here has been to the grocery store. Raise your hand if you've been. I think you've been to the grocery store. Amen. Amen. But I would also venture to say that no one here owns the grocery store. No one owns the grocery store. Now, if you do own the grocery store, bless God, hallelujah, you don't own the farm. You don't own the place where it was canned up. You don't own that. But if you own the farm, because we're in a rural area and there's a lot of farming going on around, if you own the farm, you don't own the company that made the equipment that you use to farm. Huh, my God. Even if you decided, I'm going to go off the grid and I'm going to live a self-sufficient, quote unquote, lifestyle, I'm going to live off the grid and you're growing your own food, purifying your own water, or growing your own food organically, popping your own seeds, you're doing all that, you still don't own the air you breathe. You still don't own that. So no man is an island. We were created to interact with each other. We were created to interact with each other. Each one of us gets a piece.
piece of the puzzle that God is laying before us. Each one of us do. No man is self-sufficient. Hallelujah. But even if you don't own those things I was talking about with the farm, my God, my God, you don't own the water, you don't own the sun, you don't, you didn't speak the words into existence where God told every seed to produce after its own kind. That seed is still dependent on the word of God which told it to produce. You don't own that, my God. So you are no, not self-sufficient as you think that you are. But that's one of the things that would cause us as Christians to be tripping. To be tripping. Mm -hmm. Then there's doubt, which is number two. But I'm not going to go into doubt because I'm going to talk about that in the other four. There's fear. Mm -hmm. There's fear with a side order of unbelief. Uh -huh. With a side, big, large side order of unbelief. And some of y'all got the nerve said, give me some extra salt and ketchup with my unbelief. Mm -hmm. Huh? The ten spies who came back calling themselves grasshoppers before the sons of the giants. Uh, they called themselves grasshoppers before the sons of the giants in the promised land. They used their fear with a side order of unbelief, biggie side, to sway the opinion of a nation. Oh my God. And all except for Caleb, Joshua, and Moses were swayed. This is the thing here. This, get this. The thing is that people say fearful things all the time. They do. They constantly give you a fearful diet on the news media. They constantly give you that. But it's not. But it's only the fear that you accept that's going to affect you. If you accept the fear, then it's going to affect you. It's going to be in your mind. It's going to run through your mind all the time. It's going to affect where you go anywhere, whether you do anything. It's going to affect whether you step out on faith. It's going to affect where you leave the house to go to school. It's going to affect where you leave the, the school to go to college. It's going to affect your success in life. The fear that you accept is what is going to affect you. Jesus, 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 hallelujah. The thing is that fear will expect you, affect you only if you accept it. Hallelujah. The, bro the brother David said, Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I shall what? Fear no evil. I'm walking to a place where it is that in the natural I should be afraid. Oh, but I'm not afraid. I may be a little leery, but I'm not afraid. I'm going to be a little more careful, but I'm not afraid. That's the difference between being careful and being afraid. I'm going to be very confident that the Lord walks beside me, that his rod and his staff come me. I'm going to be very confident he's going to provide a table for me in the presence of my enemy. I'm going to be very comfortable and confident in that, that God is going to make a way out of no way. He's going to turn light into uh, dark is in the light. I'll be very confident that, that God has my back. He has my side. He has my front. He has my up. He has my down. I will be very confident that I'm not going to walk in the spirit of fear. I bind up the spirit of fear. My God, my God. Hallelujah. The apostle, the apostle Paul was talking to brother Timothy, sister, and he was telling brother Timothy this. He said, he said to Timothy, he spoke to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 7. He said, perhaps, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, perhaps fear was uh, causing Timothy to be afraid. Perhaps fear was restricting him. Perhaps fear was immobilizing him. Perhaps fear, because fear is a way to immobilize you and prevent you from going forward. Hallelujah. Perhaps fear had him that and he spoke to brother Timothy and he said, son, he said, he said that God gave us love and then God gave us a sound mind and then if, if that wasn't enough, God gave us power. Just in case you didn't think the love and the sound of mind wasn't enough, he gave you power too. Hallelujah. He gave you power to speak those things not as if they already were. He gave you power to tread on serpents. He gave you power to speak to those things that are wrong in your life. He gave you power to overcome sin and the detriment of sin in your life. He gave you power to be healed. Hallelujah. He had power to be delivered. Power to be set free. He gave you power to let those yokes be broken in your life. He gave, oh my God, I ain't want to go there, but let me come back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, for, for those theologians, I know, I know that, that God, that God, and, and, and let me tell you this before I tell you the theologians thing. Look, 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 here's the thing. God didn't create creation and breathe fear into our nostrils. He breathed his spirit into our nostrils. There's no fear in God. He breathed he breathed himself up a shake, and there is no fear in God. He breathed himself out of his nostrils, went into our lungs, was not the spirit of fear, hallelujah. So he did not give us the spirit of fear. So why we keep picking fear up, my God, my God? Why we keep allowing people to get us scared? Why we keep on allowing people to make us not move forward, my God? Why we keep allowing people to immobilize us and prevent us from becoming?
becoming all that God wants us to be. My God, my God. But those theologians, though, it reads like this. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A sound mind. Hallelujah. Number four. Number four. In action. In action with a side order of unbelief. Big side order. The ten spies caused inaction. They caused the children of Israel to be shaken in their boots. But the only movement that they were doing was to shake in their boots. They were not moving forward to take what God had given them. Hallelujah. A big side of unbelief. And that, and that big side of unbelief that they had in, in their inaction, it almost destroyed a nation. But it certainly destroyed a generation because they walked around looking at the same rock for 40 years. They walked around with the same clothes on for 40 years. My God, my God. I look, they're, they're in action, my God, my God. See, God has called us to action. Oh, my God. He has called us to action. It is time out for all the inaction. It's even time out for running around trying to wake up all the sheep. It's time for the lions to wake up and to begin to roar and begin to proclaim and perfect the word of God. It's time for the lions to say that I am of Jesus. Oh, my God. It's time for the lions to wake up, my God. God. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The Lord had told me, go into the nation. You're going to conquer it. Uh -huh. You're going, not going to lose. Right. Go ahead and do it. I'm, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. But because of their fear and their inaction, mm -hmm. our act of God, because the word tells God never slumbers nor does he sleep. He's always doing something. Right. Hallelujah. Our act of God made them run around the desert for 40 years feeling foolish. Beloved, Never allow inaction to partner up with your fear Amen. and with your doubt. That's right. Because if inaction partner up with your fear and your doubt, first fear and doubt comes in, then inaction partners up with them. Mm. My God, my God. If you allow those things to happen, you're going to find yourself stuck between your blessing and your curse. Oh my God. Hallelujah. You're going to be afraid of what the curse is, but you're going to be more afraid of what the blessing is. Stop, Pastor. My God, my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number five, trusting in the physical things. Unbelief, a side order of unbelief. I ministered a sermon one time uh, at interceding, and it was entitled, uh, it was entitled Fleece Faith. I looked at the story of Jerubel, uh, hallelujah, the judge, and in that, that story of him, I looked at how our faith is sometimes hindered by our unbelief because we trust in the physical things. Hallelujah. The fleece faith is the type of faith where when God speaks, we say, God, was that you? You sure was that you? It lined up with his word. It was him. It was him. Well, God, if that was you, move this and do this or do that. Well, God, if it was you, you're riding your car. God, if it was you, let the next car I see be green. <laughs> we come up with all kinds of ways where we're testing the truth of God. We're testing the faith of God. We're coming up in all kinds of ways. And look, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of the same thing. I'm guilty. I mean, I, I look, I know not many people are going to raise their hand, but right there where you are, living on Facebook, raise your hand. You know you're guilty. My God. You're guilty of not trusting God. You say something like, God, if, it, if that was you, let my receipt at the grocery store be zero, zero. You're doing all kinds of little things, testing the truth of God's word. Isn't his word enough? It says that his word stepped down through 40 gen two generations and allowed, hallelujah, us to have the opportunity. His word got up on a sinner's cross and allowed us to have the opportunity of grace to be reconciled with God. It says that God spoke the word saying, let there be, and life was. It said, let there be, my God. God spoke the word and every animal came into existence. Nature began to operate in a certain way. God spoke the word, hallelujah, and seed began to produce after his own kind. God spoke the word, my God. Can we not just trust his word? Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, my God. We find ourselves trusting in the physical with unbelief. Now, look, trusting in the physical with a side word of unbelief can also be similar to being self-sufficient. Having barns full of wheat. So you're not worried. And it's only because you have the wheat. That's why you're not worried. Right. It's not because you believe God shall provide all your needs according to his riches and glory. It's not that. 
It's not because the, the word tells you in Matthew 6 and 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and Christ, and all those things shall be added. It's not that. That ain't the reason. You trusting things going to be okay because you have a big bank account. You trusting everything's going to be okay because you have a new car. You trusting everything's going to be okay because of those natural things. But see, your faith has to be built on God and nothing less. You got to trust God even when it don't look like you're going to make it the next step. You got to trust God when the covers are bare. You got to trust God when there's no gas in the tank. You got to trust God when everyone else around you is succumbing and dying to COVID-19. You got to still trust God. The rich man said, look at my barns, they're so full. Ooh, I got some stuff going on. I got my barns, they're full of weed. Matter of fact, I think I'm going to have to build a bigger barn. He goes down to the architect, I'm going to have to build a bigger barn. But while he was waiting to go down to the architect, he had one night of sleep and God told him, he said, you're a fool. You're a fool because this night your soul is required. So it's not about those things, hallelujah. It's not about trusting in the physical things because physical things fail. That's it's right. not about trusting those physical things because banks go bankrupt. It's not about trusting those physical things because the price of the dollar goes down. Hallelujah. The value of the dollar goes down and the price of things go up. It's not about trusting those physical things, my God. Jesus said it like this. He said, I am the bread of heaven. I'm sent down. He said that, look, look, and the Jews had the nerve to tell him, well, our fathers ate bread in the desert. Jesus said, but they all dead, aren't they? Mm. Oh, my God. We've got to learn to trust in God Almighty, trust in the powers work, trust in the things that God says to do. We've got to learn to believe that God has us, my God. We can't trust in these physical things. Oh, my God, my God. Hallelujah. What does God say about trusting the physical? Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. He said, we walk by faith, not by sight. So we don't walk because we're not blessed because we have money in the bank. We're not blessed because we have a dream job. We're not blessed because we have a gorgeous husband, wife, or whatever. We're not blessed because of that. We're blessed because God said that we are blessed. And we walk by faith and not by sight. Number six. Number six is the most common of these things that all of us have. And number six was very, very prevalent. Hallelujah. And may not have been one that was used in the young man's life, but it's very prevalent in all of our lives. All of our lives. That is, works. Works. These are things that keep us tripping on God and trip us up and block our relationship with God Almighty. These are these things, my God. Works, of course, with a large order of unbelief. Add a large order of unbelief, would you? Hallelujah. My God, my God. A scripture is found in the book of Haggai, and Haggai is a very powerful book. It only has two books. It only has two chapters in the book of Haggai. Only has two chapters in the book of Haggai. But it says something that's very powerful. It's a powerful thing that it says. It outlines, first of all, the book of Haggai outlines the life of a prophet named Haggai. Outlines the life of the prophet named Haggai, whose only focus was to get the house of God in order. To get the temple of the living God in order. Hallelujah. And it was his only focus after their captivity, being released from their captivity. His focus was, let's get the house of God in order. Get your house in order. Hallelujah. He said, let's get the house of God in order. Hallelujah. I believe that this scripture I'm going to tell you in a moment is certainly an anchor. It is one that we should use to review how we live. I see control. I'm not watching what you do. I could care less. I'll be honest. I could care less because you have to answer to God for that. It's my job to preach the gospel. It's your job to live right. My God, my God, hallelujah. I see people who post on social media. They post, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And the next post, they're blasting the world. Blast the world, oh my soul. But hey God, the scripture I give you is hey God 1 and 5. It says this. Now therefore, thus said the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. No part of your life is hidden from God. God waits for you to present to him what's going on in your life, but God already knows. He already knows what's going on, but no part of your life is hidden from God. You can hide it from me all day long and ten dimes on any day that ends with wine. That's every day. 
You can do that. But no part of your life is hidden from God. God knows you. He knows you. Your ways cause you to trip more than the ways of other people. You're talking about what other people do, but your ways are causing you to trip more than them. Because you won't be judged on what other people do. You won't be judged on what it is that you do. And you complain about what they do. Don't worry about what they do. Do what you're supposed to do. My God, my God. People so busy looking for someone to justify them living contrary to the word of God. Well, I'm living this way because they did such and such to me. I'm living this way because I was abused as a child, so therefore I'm acting out in this way. Oh, that's a lie. That's an excuse. Come up out of it. Grow up. Get out of that mindset. Hallelujah. When God said, I can be a father to the fathers. God said, I can restore all the years that you lost being suffering and pain and agony and disappointment. I can restore those things, my God, my God. Now, don't, don't sit around and make an excuse. And be living so far underneath the blessing that God has promised you. Instead of making changes, we're making more excuses than the law allowed. See, when our priorities get into alignment with what God has said, then God will get our lives together. Hallelujah. When we take care of his business, the old saints used to say, he'll take care of ours. Hallelujah. And the more we put our priorities in line with the word of God, then the more likely we are to meet with more success in life. Right. If you want to be successful, do what God says. Amen. God does not forget about what you do. Amen. Hallelujah. If you want to live successful, then do what God says. You may have to go through some trying times while you're coming to the point where it says no pain, no gain. You have to go through some suffering, some painful things while you come, while you're building muscle, you go through some suffering and some soreness and stuff, but in the end, the results are well worth the suffering. Jesus, Jesus, right. Jesus, Jesus. I've had some issues, uh, I've had some who had issues, rather, who had issues, had a real issue with pastoral teaching that doesn't include a celebration of breathing at the sermon's apex. You figure that out, what I just said, amen. Mm -hmm. They said the problem is the way of the pastor or the teacher or the preacher. But when their way is bringing truth, when the pastor's way is bringing truth, when their way is bringing understanding, when their way is brought in love, hallelujah, perhaps it's not their way that is the problem. The Bible says that people run around in the United States, they'll be looking for ear-tickling gospel. And they'll heap unto themselves those who believe the way that they believe. They'll heap unto themselves those who are teaching the way that they want things to be. They'll heap unto themselves, my God. They have the ears that are itching, looking around for the next storefront church, the next place that is going to have a preacher saying, you're going to have all this land and these houses, these cars, but not telling you anything about getting your life right with God so that those things remain a blessing. See, God adds blessings and adds no sorrow with the blessing. But you've got to be right. God is not a man that he's, he's going to lie, nor will God be mocked by foolishness. If you're not doing what you should do, my God, my God, my God, Amen. hallelujah. Amen. Oh, my God, my God. Perhaps you are tripping over your ways. Mm -hmm. If the problem is that, perhaps it's your ways that's the problem. Mm -hmm. See, if you want to find God, you must walk the way he's walking. Stand on your feet, I'm trying to wrap up. I really am, believe it or not. If you want what God has for you. You must walk the way that God walks. You got to walk God's way. You, there's no getting around it. The Bible says, uh, it says in uh, Psalm 37, it says, Order my steps in your word, Lord. Lead me, guide me every day. Hallelujah. And, and I'm adding on the song. See your anointing, Father, I pray. Order my steps, not your steps. Order my steps in your word, my God. Order my steps in your word so that I'll walk in the way that you want me to walk. I'll talk in the way that you want me to talk. I'll love people the way that you want me to love people. I will care about people the way that you want me to care about people. I will speak what it is that you say, not what it is that the enemy say. I will not spread the foolishness of the enemy's word into the lives of those around my God hallelujah hallelujah if you want to walk the way the Lord walk you got to walk the way the Lord walk you cannot walk in foolish you cannot walk in hate you cannot walk in in turmoil you cannot walk in that my God oh it just bothers me when people say things such as uh well I know I I know and uh, they won't tell you this I know I'm looking like a soup sandwich all tore up doing the wrong thing 
But God knows my heart. Yes, he does. That's what's scary. He does know your heart. He sees how you're living. He sees what's really going on with you. God knows your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You've got to know that your ways have got to be the way of God in order to be blessed. My question unto you today is what are you tripping on? Are you tripping on the relationship you have with other people because they insulted you years ago and you're still holding on to that thing? Is it like a blanket to keep you warm in the wintertime? Hallelujah. Or is it like a cooling fan that's keeping you cool in the summer? Are you tripping on those things? Go and make that thing right. They don't forget what you're mad about. Not only have you forgot, but they forgot. They don't even know why you're mad. My God, my God, my God. Hallelujah. What are you tripping on? Are you tripping on that boss who, who fired you years ago? Let's be real. You probably wasn't coming to work like you should anyway. Stop it. Stop tripping on him. Forgive that man and move forward. Let him go because he has moved forward. When you don't forgive people, you're the one who's caught up. They're not even caught up in it. They run around there. You can't even go in the room with them without hating on them. And they walk around smiling, shaking hands, going on vacations, living their lives, successful in career. You're not affecting them at all, but you have been hindered. You have been stopped. You have been immobilized because you will not let go. What are you tripping on? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. There are people who are tripping on things that make absolutely no sense. Stop tripping on what it is that happened to you as a kid. Get over it. Oh, my God. That's not telling you that you don't have pain, but take that pain to the cross. Take it to the Lord. The Lord, I'm leaving it here. And don't run back up to the altar and pick it up and throw it on your back and walk out. Oh, my God. When you release it, let it go. Let it go. Let it go. When you release it, let it go. I'm not having it no more in my life. I'm not going to allow it to stop me from doing what God has called me to do. Let it go. Jesus. I grew up in Orange Mound. And I don't know if anyone knows what Orange Mound is. but It was almost destroyed in the 80s by crack cocaine. I got many friends that are dead and in prison. Hallelujah. Many. They're dead in prison. Statistically speaking, I shouldn't have made it. Statistically speaking, but see the thing about, about figures is figures lie and liars figure. So statistically, nothing to me. But see, a, 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 a lot of people fail because they'll use that crutch. I'm from the mound. They'll use that crutch. Well, I was beat. I was mistreated. I was not liked. I'm expected to live and act a certain way. Or if I can't make it in basketball or some other sports, I'm going to sell drugs. If I can't sell drugs, I'm going to rap. If I can't rap, brother, I'm going to sell drugs. They're finding all kinds of reasons to remain failures. So my question once again is what? What are you tripping on? What are you tripping on? What are you tripping on, my God? My God. Stop tripping on social media. It don't mean you're no good anyway. Stop tripping on BET, uh, uh, MTV, and all these other foolish things that are going on in the world. Stop tripping, my God, my God. Stop letting your lack of a prayer life cause you to trip up. Stop letting your, I said again, stop letting your lack of a prayer life cause you to trip up, my God. Stop letting yourself be tripping about the foolish things of this world. If you just meditate on the word of God, Hallelujah. If you meditate on the word of God and the goodness of the Lord and the goodness and the fulfillment thereof, his word, you won't be tripping about all these things that we're tripping on. Hallelujah. Stop letting the enemy use you as a bowling ball. Using you not use as a bowling ball, he's going to make you a pin and you get knocked over. Stop letting them do it. Hallelujah. Stop letting self get in the way. Hallelujah. Glory unto God. Don't let your stumbling block or your tripping point be carnal living. You can't live any way you want to expect to go to heaven. Stop expecting the preacher to say he in heaven when you lay down before him right here. Hallelujah. Because he knows the truth and he should know. If he don't know the truth, he don't need to be preaching before you. Hallelujah. Stop allowing those things to happen. Don't think that you can come here on Sunday morning after living a hellacious life on Saturday night 
And some magic incantation, special words going to be spoken over you and God's going to say, it's all good. It's a personal thing that's within you. So my question once again is to examine your life. Really look over your life. Ask the Lord to shine his searchlight in you. Ask him to reveal you to you. Ask the Lord to show you your ways. And once he shows your ways, consider your ways. Say, Lord, please, Lord, show me, show me, Lord, what it is that I'm tripping on. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you. We honor you. We worship you for your mercy and grace, which endures to all generations. Father God, we ask that you bless this time of sharing, oh God. Let it not fall on fallow ground. Let it not fall on ground that's hard. Let it not fall by the wayside. But Lord God, allow it to be permeated as seed inside of the people that receive the seed, Father God. And Lord God, allow it the seed not to stay encapsulated inside its protective shell, but allow the seed to break forth and produce fruit. Produce wheat, oh God. Allow it to be wheat, oh God, that can be shared with others, oh God. Hallelujah. Now we bless you and glorify you for your mercy and grace which endures to us, oh God. We bless you and glorify you for what it is that you're doing in our lives right now. I speak healing. I speak healing right now. I speak healing in the minds and souls of the people who are listening in. Was in the name of Jesus we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord with a hand clap if you would. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, beloved. And I'm speaking to our people who are listening on social media and stuff. Everyone else can be seated. Amen. Beloved, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and I guess it's applicable to everybody as well, get to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And further, the Lord has pressed upon my heart, and I do it every time I have a sermon, every time we have a Bible study teaching, amen. My, my throat was hurting the other day, and I had my wife do it for me, amen. Hallelujah. And it is since this December, the Lord has told me to talk about the rapture, to talk about the rapture. Listen, no man knows the day, nor he knows the hour. No one knows when the rapture is going to occur. Matthew 24 tells us that only God knows when it's going to occur. But I'm telling you, I'm looking at the signs. He said, you'll know it's going to happen because the signs will be in the north, south, east, or west. You'll have wars and rumors of wars. You'll, you'll have earthquakes in diverse places. You'll have all kinds of things that are going on. I was looking at something recently where it talked about, uh, 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 you know, the most famous scripture in the world around 911. Or see, if my people will call by my name, you know, humble themselves. Hallelujah and pray. But before that scripture, it talks about what God will do. It talked about the weather. It talked about locusts in the land. It talked about the disruption, destruction that will be going on. Hallelujah. And the problem isn't necessarily the destruction that's going on. The problem is a lack of repentance. The problem is the people have not repented. And this nation will continue to go through things because we are not repentant. My God. I was talking about the rapture. Let me get back to that. If the rapture has occurred because you have seen where people disappeared and they're telling you all kinds of hocus pocus and foolish things about what happened to the millions, the number that no man can number that has disappeared. They're telling you all kinds of foolish stuff. The rapture has occurred. Beloved, you may have missed the rapture, but you still can make it into the kingdom. How you make it to the kingdom? Right where you are. Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Somehow through the miracle and grace of God, he's allowed you to see this part of the video. Maybe not all of it, but this part of the video. You can just repent right where you are. Ah, oh, Jesus. Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And Jesus will accept you in. You may go through hell on your way out because the enemy's going to try to get you to get the mark of the beast. And by the way, just to make sure we reiterate, reiterate this, listen. The market beast is a choice. You're going to be fully aware of what it is that you're doing. The enemy's going to tell you. He's bound to tell you what you're doing. You're going to know. So it's a choice. Don't accept it. And once you don't accept it, he'll kill you. He'll take your physical life. But your eternal life will begin from that point. You'll find yourself walking the streets of gold. Hallelujah. You'll find yourself in the presence of an angelic choir. You'll hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. Also, beloved, finally, 
If the Lord has touched your heart and you want to be a blessing to Interceding Christian Center, then you can be a blessing by going to the Android or the Apple Store and download Givify or the Cash App. We have both of them available. If you download the Givify app and utilize that app, that's your preference, that's your choice, that's fine. Then all you have to do is go and look for the picture of my lovely wife, Pastor Tina Schaefer, and you'll be a blessing to us at the ministry in that way. And receive your blessing to us using our Cash App. Our Cash App identifier is dollar sign interceding CC. Dollar sign interceding CC. And I would be totally remiss and totally out of order if I did not thank those who support us. There are many who have never stepped foot in the land, into this facility, or stepped foot into the church. But they follow us online, and they bless us monthly, monthly, monthly. Thank God for those who are, who are able to do so. Amen. I'm praying that you continue to bless us. Thank God for those who we will attend other ministries, but they, they're living out of state, and they continue to bless us. Love you with the love of Christ. God bless you. Thank you for being a blessing to us. Amen. I love you with the love of Christ. I'm going to have my beautiful wife come up just to show her face. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love you with the love of Christ. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I pray that you enjoyed the word today and that it touches you within a deep place in your heart and it will spark a change that should come about in your life. If the Lord so touched your heart and you have a desire to give, you can give to this ministry as we continue to make impacts in this city at our Givelify app. Simply download the Givelify app at one of the app or the Google store and look for Interceding Christian Center. Here at Interceding, we aspire to bring people to spiritual knowledge and thus victory. God bless you.